All right, here we are, folks. It's Friday, about 9.30, and I'm making the first video that uh, you're going to get uh, into uh, Bio 210 in these sections in which I am the instructor of. So uh, hopefully this will give you something to think about, you know, and, and of course, be responsible for uh, the material on the test. So I'm Mr. Pritchett. And you have uh, a syllabus in your B2L. I got a phone number here. Uh, got my email address and so forth. So if you need me, that's okay. Shoot me an email like some of you have been doing. That's what I'm here for. Now, as we get into um, this chapter, chapter one in, in the textbook, and I hope you've already found out that your textbook is in your uh, D2L. Mine is going to be uh, a second edition. I think you, a first edition, I think you've got a second edition. And so the pages may be off a little bit until I can get a new text that it lines up with you. So you may be a page or two off, but I'll list the pages that I'm looking at. And you'll probably find the titles that will uh, be the ones that I'm covering today. So in chapter one, I'm actually on page two, and I don't know what number that uh, page is for you, but uh, you're looking at how to develop study skills. Um, I came out of high school without having to study hard. I bet you didn't either. And then I got to the Citadel, and buddy, it was not a cakewalk, I can tell you. I had to learn how to study. So as you look in that section, there's a section called how to read a textbook. I hope it's still in the one that, that you've got the new one. I haven't seen the new one yet. But anyway, how to read a textbook. I had to learn how to do that. I didn't do that for three years. I was interested in surfing and dating girls whenever they let us off campus. So uh, my priorities were not what they should have been. But senior year, I started doing what this thing says about how to read a text and I began to use my time effectively. Now, I hope you've got the time. If you don't, it's going to be tough with you. And I know you've got some other responsibilities. I had military responsibilities. And, um, and then I had study and so forth and sometimes some athletics. But if you don't use your time wisely, you can easily get yourself in a hole that you can't dig yourself out of. But anyway, um, you see the on how to read a text there, and at the end it talks about recite and review. And I see where it says recite. Play like you're the teacher. That's what I did. When I had free time between classes, I went back to the barracks, got in my room, and I made some outlines, say renal physiology, and I taught it to the bookcase. And it worked. I went from a 2.6 GPA to a 3.3. It was great. I thought, golly, I really do have some neurons up there. And I kept using that mechanism, this particular series of uh, steps, went to grad school. And in grad school, you got to make an A or B. You can't make a C or you'll be out of there. So I uh, worked in grad school. It'll do it for you if you will use it. Consider yourself an athlete. Now, athletes don't wait. When they have a track meet on Friday afternoon, they don't start practicing for the mile run on Wednesday, do they? No, they spend weeks, start out jogging, start walk a little bit, rest, jog some more, and they build their, their endurance up. Same thing is going to have to happen with you. Every day, practice. You might have to add new material. Practice teaching the material to your closet door, to your bathroom door, something like that. Or Mr. Malakowski would tell you, teach your pet rock. That's good. But get into it. That's what I had to do. And then I realized, gosh, I really can do this stuff. You can too. But you've got to have the time. That is a big issue. All you can do is spend the time as wisely as you can. So, Give it, give it the best shot. And if you have questions, of course, email me or something like that. So 
here you, here you are getting your first lecture on how to succeed, right? Because it worked for me. So managing your time there. And we're going to come over to, um, let's see, we're on, I'm on page seven now. And um, we're, we're looking at module 1.2, overview of anatomy and physiology. So as you look at the heading there, you see this little area called learning outcomes. That's a great thing to read before. So you're looking for those answers in terms of the learning outcomes. Oh, I recognize that. The characteristics of life or the major structural levels of organization. Ah, okay, that's what I need to know. That's right, because I'm going to ask you questions about that. We're laying a foundation for your success as we go through the book. So as you look on, in this case, it's page eight, might be page nine, page seven, six or something like that, but locate the one that the section says characteristics of living organisms. Now we're not gonna get into all of these, but I just want you to know a couple of them. Uh, metabolism, that's the chemical activity that goes on in the body. And then you come down to uh, responsiveness, that's something that you're going to need in terms of uh, determine if the patient's alive, right? You don't see responsiveness. Uh, well, we get, got a little problem on our hands there, don't we? Movement. Movement suggests life. No movement. You're either asleep or you're dead, right? Or maybe paralyzed, unfortunately. So, metabolism, know what that basically is, because we'll get into it in chapter two, and then responsiveness and movement. Let me mark that right there. Okay. Now, you go to the second column on that same page, and you see it says levels of structural organization and body systems. So, you want to know those structural or the, or the, the levels of structural organization. Starts out with chemicals. It even gets smaller than that which we'll get into in chapter two. Everything's made of chemicals. The body that we uh, live in is made of chemicals. And I watched, it, I watched this thing, it was real neat. Somebody brought me a, a, a Carolina anole. It's one of those little green lizards, got the little red thing that they blow out. That's what the males do. Look at me, look at me, I'm tough, you know? And so, I, can, I sometimes collect specimens like that. It's been anywhere from bugs to snakes and so forth. And uh, they're all made of chemicals. And I watched this dead anole on a piece of paper turn back to dust, to dirt. I watched it over a month. It was real interesting to see the change. There's a scripture in the, the Bible that says, uh, dust you are and dust you're going to return to. That's the body that does that. So if we didn't put formaldehyde in our body, within uh, a couple of months, we'd be dirt. Skeletons would take longer uh, to deteriorate, but the flesh does so within several months. Saw little bugs crawling on the, um, the Carolina knoll. And, uh, and so... Uh, can't do it, Kim. Okay, somebody's trying to call me. They don't know I'm on this thing. So anyway, uh, little bugs got on there. Where did those little bugs come from? I'm, I'm not sure, but they found it. And they ate the flesh, defecated. So dirt is part fecal material from little bugs that eat things and break them down. Okay. So everything's made of chemicals. And then the chemicals are... are placed in a particular order and you get cells and then you the, <sighs> can I'm in the middle of get, doing a video buddy I'll call you back all right no I'm at school working on this video yeah I'm there buddy bye bye He didn't know I was on, online there. That's all right. Anyway, uh, let's see, where were we? Oh, yeah, those little bugs defecating. So, you know, dirt's part, fecal material from dead things. 
So uh, you've had compost piles and you know that all turns back into dirt. Then you can put it back around your tomatoes and stuff like that and your peppers and, and you've got some enriched soil. So that's what's going to happen to these bodies. Takes a little bit longer time with formaldehyde, but the critters that are on us eventually break it down. So anyway, chemicals are organized into cells. Cells get uh, put together to, you know, to make a tissue. And you want to know the definition, be able to define what these levels are. Um, organs, the tissues, you have several different kinds of uh, tissues that can make up an organ, like your heart. Your heart is composed of um, muscle. It's composed of connective tissue. It's composed of nervous tissue. So there's three different tissues that make that structure. And then you, that's the organ. And then when you put org, an organ with another organ, then you get a system. The heart is connected with arteries and veins. Okay. Then that, you got a number of different organ systems, actually 11 of them. And uh, you put them together. And in our case, we come up with a human an organism. So uh, look at the quick check down below there. It says, what are the six levels? You want to know, you be able to name them. You want to know them and understand them because we're going to be talking about them all during this semester. And then you look at where it says number two, that's your levels. And then number three, list the organ systems. So we'll get to that in just a second, but look over on page uh, nine and you're looking at types of anatomy and physiology. You see those bold terms in there and you see uh, things like gross anatomy. You can highlight that. Um, you're going to see some of that online, unfortunately, because of the, uh, the COVID. Microscopic anatomy, that's where you look at cells and tissues under the microscope. Histology deals with tissues. Cytology deals with the cells. And then you look at the last little Paragraph, physiology has numerous fields. Physiological specializations are classified according to the organ, like nervous physiology, digestive physiology, okay? And so you can look at the quick check. You might see some of those questions on the test. Imagine that. How about that? All right, let's look over on page 10 and 11. And on page 10 and 11, uh, you've got uh, pictures of these folks here with the various organ systems displayed. And what I want you to do is you want to know those organ systems. And when you uh, look underneath there, they give you a number of functions. What I want you to do is know the first function of each of those organs. Obviously, there are a number of functions with each organ system. We'll build on that, but to start with, integumentary system protects the body from the external environment. You bump up against stuff, you rub on stuff, stuff, it gets hot outside and you've got little receptors in here, which we'll talk about, and they pick up, oh, you're hot, well, you've got to do something about that. It's fascinating stuff, and you don't have to think about it. You got it, it's already set. It's going to work for you to keep you alive. But you want to know the 11 organ systems, and you want to know the uh, first function that's listed there, okay? Now, we come over to page 12 in this book, module 1.3, and you see the learning outcomes, anatomical position. You will learn that in lab. I may ask you that, too. We intertwine lab and lecture a little bit so that when you get to the final exam, that is a comprehensive exam. It's got lab and lecture on it. So you can check off number one and number two, directional terms, and then number six, identify various planes. I'm gonna hold you accountable for that. So know what the anatomical position is. Be able to describe it. You can see the lady standing there in the anatomical position. When you come over to the next figure, figure 1.6, this is on page 13 in the old text, you see a couple of folks standing there and you see those terms 
proximal and distal and superior and inferior and lateral and medial and so forth. So you want to know those. So you got a quick, you got a chart over here on page 13 and you got a quick check down at the bottom. And we're not going to do the regional terms. Uh, you'll get plenty of that. And you look over on page 15 and you see um, quick check again. Imagine those things showing up on the test. That's what we're trying to get into you. So it becomes normal. This is your, this is going to be your language, whether you're in radiology or where you're, whether you're a nurse or whether you're going to be a physical therapist or something like that. This is your language. It hadn't become mine. Okay. Planes of section on page 15. So you want to know those planes, sagittal, mid-sagittal, parasagittal, frontal, transverse, and so forth. How the body gets sliced, recognizing the view that a person is taking at a particular part of the body. Now we're going to move over to module 1.4 uh, and the organization of the human body. So you come down, you see their body cavities. Again, look at the learning outcomes. Okay, look at the learning outcomes. What time we got? Oh, we're good. We've got some time left. So the dorsal body cavity, and you'll find out dorsal. Okay, that means back, right? And you can see a picture of it on figure 1.9. Well, when we get to chapter 11 and 12 and 13, we'll be dealing with the dorsal body cavity and the organs that are located within that cavity. Okay, so you see we're building from the ground up, you got to have a foundation and then you add to that foundation. So uh, you want to know the body cavities, the dorsal body cavity, and then you want to know the ventral body cavity. We're going to talk about structures in that cavity also. You look over on page, the second column on page 17, figure 1.9, look down below on the right, and you see the thoracic cavity. That's your chest, isn't it? I've got to look at this laptop. I look at the screen, look like I'm talking up to the ceiling. But anyway, pleural cavity, mediastinum, and uh, pericardial cavity. So you want to know those cavities, and then you see the abdominal pelvic cavity. You see the picture of it up there, and there are organs in that system. Now, probably a number of you know the organism, organs, excuse me, that are in the those cavities. That's great. There'll be some, you would be adding to that all through the semester so that you see a number of different uh, organs are located in a cavity. So let's scoot over to page 21, and that's going to be module 1.5, Core Principles in Anatomy and Physiology. Now, one of the things that we want to talk about a little bit is as you look at the learning outcomes, the principle of homeostasis. Now, some of you had 110. That's great. You have that word in your mind already. And you know it means a balanced internal environment. Some of you haven't heard about that. But there are a lot of mechanisms that we have that keep our body stable. Not too hot, not too cold. Okay. Uh, not too high a sugar level. Not too low a sugar level. We've got to have homeostasis. And there are hundreds of mechanisms that keep the body in check. So as you um, consider, you look at page 21, come down that first column there. Um, you see it says uh, phys physiological processes. And so... What we're going to do is talk a little bit about that, but just the concept, keeping the body's internal environment stable. Quick check after that. Make sure you can be able to define homeostasis and give an example of an imbalance, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Now you come down to core principle one, feedbacks used to maintain homeostasis. And you see they, uh, um, a feedback loop is a structure that can help change the internal environment 
when it's been set uh, offset in some direction, bring it back to the middle so that we have the balance in there. You don't want to have too much water in your body or too little. Okay, that's another thing that's in homeostasis, keeping the water balance. So as you look over on page 22, you see the heading said negative feedback, negative feedback loops. Notice come down about one, two, three, four lines. And you see it says when a change in a regular, regulated variable is detected, a change, our body picks up on it. Actions are triggered that will bring the regulated variable back to normal. That's a negative feedback. The body starts to go off a particular way. The negative feedback loop, which we're going to look at in just a second, brings it back into the middle. If you could, um, let's see if they have a picture of this. I'm not sure if they do or not. Mm, I don't see it right now. But anyway, just imagine the, the needle being here. And so if the needle goes over here, uh, that's not good. You don't want to maintain that. So what we have is this mechanism that will change the internal environment so the needle comes back to the middle. It's being balanced is what it is. You don't want to eat too much. You don't want to eat too little. You don't want to drink too much. You, want, you don't want to drink too little. Okay. So that's a negative feedback. Now let's look at that for just a second. They give you an example on page 23. This is figure 1.13, figure 1.13. And they're showing you um, a situation that's not, not totally accurate in a sense. I'm going to ask you this in your Word document that I'm going to send you. But let's look at the top. And you see we've got one, two, three, four, five blocks there. So you see a stimulus up there. And you see what it says, room temperature decreases below 70 degrees. I've got a friend who shivers below uh, 90 degrees. If he gets below 90 degrees, he's, got, he's like a turtle. Man. He's got to have heat. But that's just the way he's built. Some people are not built like that. Some people be sweating profusely at 90 degrees or less. So anyway. You have a receptor that is some sort of a structure, a nervous structure that picks up a change in the temperature. So you see it says goes below 70 degrees. So the receptor, a sensory protein, a sensory structure of some kind picks that up, sends a message through a nerve to the control center. Now the control center in this case for our temperature is located in the middle of the brain. It's a structure called the hypothalamus, of which we'll discuss later. So the hypothalamus sends a message through another nerve to cause us to um, produce heat. Now, how do we produce that heat? Look at the bottom of that figure and you see the signal sent to the muscles. Our muscles start to what? Shake, shiver. Okay. Anytime the muscles start to contract, produces heat. That's how we do it. Some of you have been cold. I have too. I did uh, my basic training out in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and I've never been so cold in my life. I'm from Georgia, right up on the west side of Georgia, almost in Alabama. But man, it was cold out there in that place. And uh, as a consequence, you, <laughs> I mean, it would, you were just shaking with the cold, even though they gave you some good clothing, especially your feet. Holy boy, they hardly ever warm up. But anyway, that's what the muscle does. When it, when it starts shivering, it produces heat. It's going to keep you alive. If the temperature gets too low, you got a problem. We'll talk about how that, how that creates a problem for you. But anyway, um, that's an example of a homeostatic mechanism, a negative feedback loop that changes the original condition, the original condition being cold, and the body recognizes that and tries to keep the body at 98 degrees or so, 97, 
so that uh, chemical actions can take place, okay? The opposite would happen if you get too hot. And so when that happens, the sensors pick it up, send it to the middle of the brain, the hypothalamus, sends messages back to a number of things, but we're just gonna mention one thing and that's your sweat glands. And so you sweat. Now in South Carolina, you know you can't get cool in July and August because the humidity is so high and you can't have that sweat that you produce evaporate. You get cool when your sweat evaporates. So it's hard to get cool in July and August if you're out there outside or you don't have air conditioner or whatever. You go to some place like Arizona or other seasons in South Carolina where the humidity is lower, then the sweat evaporates and you cool off. Okay, that's a homeostatic mechanism. You don't have to think about it. It's built into your genes. All you can do is just be a human and your genes are going to create that circuitry that's going to work automatically. So you're free from thinking about it. So that's a negative feedback where you change the original condition back to normal. Now, you see down on the bottom of page 22 in the second column, it talks about positive feedback. Now, that sounds good, but it, and it is. Um, but in a positive feedback, when the situation develops, it doesn't reverse the, the situation. It actually increases the situation. It increases whatever activity that normally doesn't happen. And one of the examples of that that I'm going to give you is uh, birth. Now, we all got birthed. And some of you girls have brought in children into the world, too. And when that child inside that womb grows, it stretches the uterus. And so when it stretches to a certain point, a message through nerves goes to the hypothalamus. That little thing does a whole lot of stuff, a whole lot of stuff. And that circuitry sends a message back to the uterus. The do it by causing, uh, by a nervous uh, pathway, it does it by a hormone. We'll talk about it later. But the hormone makes the uterus contract more and more and more until you push that kid out. Because being pregnant for 45 years is not normal, is it? No, it's only normal for a while. And then you expel the fetus into your arms, doctor's arms, now you got your little kid on the on your breast up there. And you're all glad it's all over with. Yeah, until you want another one. That's a positive feedback because it increased the contractions of the uterus rather than stopping the contractions of the uterus. Uterus, because uterus doesn't normally contract, right? If you're not pregnant, it doesn't contract. Only when it's pregnant, okay? All right, let's leave that and let's look at on page 25. And you can do the quick check. How do negative feedback loops maintain homeostasis? Explain how positive and negative feedback loops are different. Put that in a series of words. If you got a question about it, shoot me an email about it. Let me know your definition. I'm trying to get you not only to memorize some things, but understand them. And when you understand them, you can explain them and apply them. That's where you get strong, okay? We want those doctors up there to, and nurses to say, whoa, whoa, you have some understanding of things, don't you? Yeah. Which Florence Darlington Tech. So, page 25, second column, core principle two, structure and function are related at all levels of organization. Structure, that's anatomy. Function, that's physiology. They give you a real good example down here. Now, before we do this, I want you to think for a minute. Um, you know what a nail file is, right? We all have fingernails. Now, some of you clip your fingernails. That's great. Some of you take a nail file and you keep them under control because, you know, they can get long, right? And so... That nail file has the purpose of filing down your nails. 
you would not use a nail file to nail a nail into some wood. It's not made to do that. Its structure dictates its function. Okay? Just like that pencil. It's got a function. You don't use it to start your car. Okay? It doesn't have that function. It doesn't have that capability. As you look at the bottom of page 25, figure 115, 1.15, you see the tissues in the first little block, and they're thin, thin little tissues. That's a little sac in your lungs. You've got 300 million of those little sacs. And that's where gas exchange takes place. Oxygen moves out of the, out of the lung into the blood, and CO2 comes out. Very thin. So the oxygen doesn't have to fight, as it were, to get into your bloodstream. And the CO2 doesn't have to fight to get out of the bloodstream. But look what happens if you have a thick layer. I was looking up the other day about how sometimes the alveoli can get tough and thick, and it slows down the exchange of gases. Structure and function are related. You need a very thin membrane there so that the exchange of gases works well. Structure dictates function. Now, Let's move into page 26. And on page 26, we're in the second column. And we're looking at core principle number three, gradients drive many physiological processes. When you think of gradient, most of us don't use that word. You do use the word grade. And in most of our minds, grade means the um, the number of points I got out of, out of a test. Maybe you got 100. We say, oh, that's a great grade, right? Yeah. But when you think about a grade in, in an engineering field, um, grade is deals with elevation. You, you know homes where the street level is lower than the home. The home is up on a little hill, and we say there's a grade from the road to the home. The grade gets higher under as it's up there with a home, and so we do that. So if it floods the street, the water doesn't come into the home. So you, have you ever been to North Carolina? or Tennessee, and you go up these mountain roads. I-26 gets uh, pretty steep at times, doesn't it? That's a grade. It's low here in South Carolina, and Hendersonville, Tryon, and all those places like that. Uh, they're at a different grade. Where I grew up, we were 1,400 feet above sea level. South Carolina, or Florence might be 50 or 60 feet above sea level. There's a grade difference. So now you got the, I hope you've got the understanding. It means that things are not even, okay? There's more dirt under the house than there is under the road. Okay, like we said, you got a grade from the road to the house. That's nice, that's real good. So when you look at gradients, you see they say it's uh, uh, something exists in one area um, that another and the two are connected. More of something, excuse me, I left that word out. More of something exists in one area than another and the two areas are connected. In our case, in terms of anatomy and physiology, we're interested in a temperature gradient or we could be interested in a concentration gradient that would deal with chemicals. Or we could deal with, if you come down Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 12 lines. You look at that sentence, it says finally one point, figure 1.16c shows a pressure gradient. Let's think about a pressure gradient for just a minute. There is a pressure gradient between the aorta, which is the big vessel that comes out of your left ventricle, 
and the blood vessels in your feet. There is a gradient, higher pressure here, lower pressure in your feet. The farther the blood vessels go from the heart, the lower the pressure. But it's that pressure, that gradient, that pushes blood through our cardiovascular system. We've got something like 60 or 70,000 miles of capillaries and blood vessels. And so you gotta, got to get that blood through all those highways, if we could use that sort of term. The reason it moves is because there's a gradient. Okay? There's a gradient. As you look at the bottom of the page, uh, we talked a little bit about heat. Um, there's a gradient between us and the environment in this office. This temperature in this office is 73 degrees. The temperature in my body is around 98 degrees. There is a gradient there. So, uh, and you have probably been around people who put off heat a lot. Maybe you stood by me and said, good night. And boy, you're putting off a lot of heat. That's a gradient. You can feel it. They're warmer than you are. There's more heat coming off of them than there is you. And so the heat tends to flow from a high concentration to a low concentration. The same thing is true of a chemical. As you see in the little uh, beaker down there where they put a, a pill in there. Think about iced tea. And people put sugar in their iced tea and stir it around. Well, there's a lot of tea at the bottom we mentioned and uh, a lot of sugar at the bottom. And it gradually dissolves in and gets throughout the whole glass of tea, but you don't get to do that if you wait long enough for that to happen to a cold glass of tea. It's good to put it in when it's hot, isn't it? Then it goes into solution real quickly. But there's a gradient. There's a bunch of sugar at the bottom, very little sugar at the top. Over time, that will even out. But there's a gradient, a concentration gradient in terms of, of uh, chemical. And then you look at the pressure gradient in your... Uh, in that syringe, and we've already talked about the pressure gradient. So we got a pressure gradient, heat gradient, and chemical concentration gradient. They are, they are, let's see, I've lost my word, uh, so important in the health of our body. They are very important in terms of the health of our body. When you think about gases, Concentration gradient in the lung is higher than in the blood in your chest. So that the oxygen comes out of the alveoli, out of the lungs, and into the blood. If you don't have that gradient, you don't get an oxygen exchange and CO2 exchange. you got to have that gradient. We depend on gradients. Okay? And the fourth principle is um, cell communication. Cells talk to each other. That's basically what they're saying. We have even found out, and I've been kind of blown away and excited teaching microbiology, bacteria talk to each other chemically. Oh, and I go, wait a minute now. Conversation, information, that implies intelligence. All I can do is say, look what they found out. We didn't know that. Don't ever think science has got it all figured out. We know enough to get a job and help people and pay our bills and have some reward in our own hearts about helping people, you guys in the medical group. So cells talk to each other, either chemically or electrical electrical, I'm losing my word here, electrochemical through electricity or through just basically chemicals. And so why do we need that? Because we have all these tissues that work together, communicate. The uterus, when it contracts, communicates with the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus sends a hormone back to communicate to the uterus, squeeze harder, and out comes the child. Out comes the fetus. It's a child after that, right? No, it's a baby. Yeah. Okay. So 
we're going to get into how cells, the point at which cells talk to each other. Now, uh, I'm going to send you a Word document. And the Word document is going to um, basically give you an outline of what I've talked about. But then on uh, the chapter summary, I want you to look at, uh, I've got the, the modules listed, module 1.5, and these are the core principles. I am saying that because we're going to talk about it. We're going to build on them as we go through the textbook. And then you see in your Word document, which you'll get, there are questions I want you to look at and see if you can answer them. It's a good source for me to put questions on there to see if you're checking those things off and understand them. Okay. Well, we did it in 40 minutes. So we've done chapter one. That's going to be in you, and the Word document is going to be in your D2L. We're going to set it up. We have week one, week two, week three, week four. So this is going to be dropped into week one. Start studying it. Start teaching it to the closet door. If you can teach it without using your notes, great starts going up. I smile, you smile, everybody's happy. Okay? All right, you guys have a, a good weekend. Time you get this, it'll be probably Monday, but anyway, I'll be in touch with you. Bye-bye.